nabbed him, and you guys are going to be amazingly blessed. So would you guys stand to your feet and welcome my brother, Dr. Jim Bradford. Well, thank you. I, I loved being here last September with some of the guys at the conference for men, and uh, once in a while, I preached in the past here, but so good to see all of you. So good to see all of you here today. And I do want to honor my mom. What a spiritual legacy she has left, all of us. Mom and my dad who passed away over 15 years ago, but they left an amazing spiritual legacy, and mom still continues to do that. And we honor you, Mom. Uh, your influence is reaching all the way to your great-grandchildren. And happy birthday tomorrow. Yeah, pretty cool. And it's great to see uh, my, uh, the middle of my three younger sisters, uh, Brenda here and Todd and Kelsey and, and Taylor. Uh, their two children. They live in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. It's on fire right now, in a bad way right now, but... Uh, um, bless you guys. So good to see you. Looking forward to catching some time with you. And um, I know I'm, I'm painfully aware how disappointing it is to come to church and find out your, your pastors are not speaking. But maybe this will help. If you just tell yourself that I taught Pastor Joanne everything she knows. <laughs> you know, it's not completely true, but it might make you feel better this morning. I'd like to speak to you today. As all around the world, churches are celebrating Pentecost Sunday today. Um, I'd like to speak to you about God's Spirit and your story. There's a story of God's purpose in the world that is involving you very, very personally through the gift of His Spirit. And I love a, a, what an African-American pastor once said when he got up to speak to the college students in his church. He said, children, you're going to die. Someday they're going to take you out and drop you in a hole and throw dirt on your face and, and go back to the church and eat potato salad. What a, what a picture of your future. He said, but here's what the question will be. He said, when you were born, you alone were crying and everybody else was happy. But when they throw you in that hole someday, are you alone going to be happy and everybody else crying? Because they've just lost the best friend they ever had. And the key is whether you're going to go after in life, you're going to go after titles or you're going to go after testimonies. See, titles are what you do for yourself. That's what success is. Success, in fact, is about what you do for yourself. But significance is what you do for others. Significance has everything to do with the world around you. This is why God has given you his spirit. It's, no, it's so that you're, you're not going to stop at just being blessed. You're going to stop a change in the world around you because the spirit that God has given to you wants to flow through you. You're going to be God's person everywhere you go this week. You're going to be God's plan for your company. You're going to be God's person in your family. Who knows what God's going to do through you this week? Not because you're better looking than everybody else. Although this crowd may be. The rest of us, I don't know what God was thinking, but uh, it has nothing to do with how talented you are, how good looking you are, but you have the Spirit of God in you and the Spirit of God to you wants to flow through you. This is what we celebrate today. And I believe that the Old Testament interprets or, or, or helps us understand the New Testament. The New Testament is Jesus coming, dying in our place, carrying our sin on himself and then blown out of that grave three days later to give us new life when we trust him. And, uh, and, and, and that's then God's spirit on the day of Pentecost coming to his church and then the story of his living church, which is continuing to this very day. Uh, and that's what the New Testament's all about. But the, the Old Testament is helpful to us because it, it helps us understand what we then encounter in the New Testament. And so I'm going to go, I'm going to head for the day of Pentecost in the New Testament. We're going to start in the Old Testament with one of the most famous leaders in the Bible. His name was Moses. Moses had just done the Charlton Heston thing, right? He had just led, led the Israelites through the Red Sea after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. They were delivered. Now they were on their way 
to the land that God had promised them, the promised land, and they're in that in-between time, just like you and me. We're somewhere in between. God, having set us free when we met Jesus, set us free from the power of sin and the power of this world, and we're on our way to heaven. We're not there yet, but we're in between, and this is where Israel was, in between. And there's hundreds of thousands of them out in a wilderness. I've, I've seen part of that wilderness, and it's, it's barren, it's desolate. Agriculture is not possible there. It's very dry. You, to be all alone in the wilderness would mean you do not survive. And there, there are, in this case, hundreds of thousands of people, but, you, but that, that, magnet, that, that amplifies the problem. How do you feed hundreds of thousands of people? And so one day, the people of Israel, after they had run out of the food they had taken from Egypt, they woke up, and they saw this white flaky stuff on the ground all over. And uh, they said, what's that? In Hebrew, what's that means manna, is manna, the word manna. And it was food that God started raining down from heaven every day for 40, for 40 years to feed them. It was sweet and it had nutrition to it. And that's how they ate. And so every morning they get up and said, oh, it's more of what's that? And they ate it. And they lived. And as a result, uh, as a result however, after a few months of that, you know, they start getting tired of manna, right? Green in his song. Uh, you know, it was banana, banana bread in the morning and manna burgers for lunch and manna cotti for dinner. They were sick of manna. And so they start going like, it was the first fad food, fast food ad in history. Like, where's the meat? Where's the beef? And so here we are in Numbers chapter 11 in verse 10. And Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. This is like some churches I've seen. <laughs> Verse 11, and he asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servants? This is Moses to God. Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? I mean, God, what, what have I ever done in my life to deserve having to be these people's pastor? Verse 13, where can I get meat for all these people? They're going, where's the meat? Keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. So Moses is having a very bad hair day here. And in verse 15, the next verse, he goes this far. He says, if this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me now. And if I've found favor in your eyes, do not let me face my own ruin. Lord, if, you, if, you've, if I have any kind of favor in your eyes, please do not let me have to be their pastor for another day. Just kill me right now. None of this slow death stuff, having to lead these people. I mean, this was not a good moment. And so God comes and steps in. And God says, okay, Moses, I'm going to give you some help going to give you some help. I'd like you to select 70 people from the tribe of Israel. And uh, these, these would be the elders. These would be, if you had another level of leadership below Moses, this would be the other leadership. And he said, now this is Holy Spirit language now. He said, I'm going to take the spirit that's on you, Moses. Moses is the one who would go to the tent of meeting just outside the camp. And he communed with God face to face. This was Moses who stretched out his rod and the Red Sea parted and the people walked, uh, walked over into freedom. And this is, this is Moses who God spoke to, whose face glowed uh, later on as he had been in the presence of God up in the mountain. This was Moses. And God said, Moses, you've been the guy, but I'm going to now take. You want help? I'm going to take the spirit that's on you and I'm going to put that spirit on the 70 elders. And they are going to help you lead these people. And, and this, we're not quite, you and I are not quite in the story yet. But this is the beginning of that story. Where from just one spiritual superstar, God begins to expand the number of people that he begins to put his spirit on to help get his work going. I remember I was an engineering student and I, I was, you know, I grew up very shy. I mean, growing up when I was a teenager, I was short, I was shy, watched Star Trek too much. But I loved Jesus and I remember just thinking that God had nothing he could use in me. I, I, I avoided speech classes. 
That might be obvious to you. I avoided every speech class I could avoid. I mean, I hated all of, I didn't think God, but I did love Jesus. And I remember the Lord, I, I, I remember I went to the University of Minnesota. I was leading a little Bible study that had a supernatural spiritual breakthrough. And I remember we started, grow, we grew overnight from 12 to 65, then to 100. And, and I remember it started getting away on me. And I never led anything in my life. And I'd never planned on being a pastor or a spiritual leader. But here I, I was leading this whole thing. And I was still a full-time engineering student. I remember one night I was praying late. I was just having an insecurity meltdown. You ever had those? You know, like, God, why'd you call me? I know way more talented people. I know way better looking people. I know people with better voices. I know people who love public speaking, which I hate. You know, I mean, why didn't you call somebody else? And I was just having this meltdown. And, and, and I, I, I pictured this, this pathway, which is like my life way into the future. And this pathway was lined with people, all kinds of people. And the Lord said, see all those people? Those are the people I want, your, I, I want to touch through you in the years ahead. And, then, and, and the Lord said, so let me put it to you this way, Bradford. Maybe this will help you. I love those people so much that I'll even use you if I have to. <laughs> in, in kind of a twisted way, it helped me a lot. Because this is part of what the Holy Spirit does. This is what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. It helps us get over ourselves. Yeah. Now wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes. If we just kind of got over ourselves. You know, we're not in the way. He said, I want you in the way. I don't care if you're not as talented as somebody else. I want to put my spirit on you. Moses said, I want you to pull 70 guys together. I'm going to put my spirit on them. And we're going to start doing this together. This was just kind of the foreshadowing of what would come later. So, Moses calls them all out to that tent of meeting, you know, just outside the camp where, where they are. And there was a certain time they were supposed to be there. And, and then God said, I'm going to put my spirit on them. So, get them out and the tent of meeting. So, 68 of them make it out to the tent of meeting. All but two were actually given their names as the story goes on in Numbers 11, Eldad and Medad. And I don't know why they didn't make it. They probably were stuck in traffic back in camp. They didn't make it. I mean, the time came, they weren't there. And God's spirit fell on those 68. And they began to prophesy. They just began to, to prophetically proclaim God's praise in a way they couldn't before. That only the spirit of God through us can do. And God mobilized their mouths. And they began to be God's mouthpiece of praise and prophetic declaration. It says the spirit of God came on them and they started to prophesy. Those 68. But the funny thing was, the two that didn't make it on time, that didn't quite do it right, they're back stuck in traffic somewhere, and they start prophesying as well at that moment. A messenger comes running from the camp and says, Moses, those two guys who weren't in the right place at the right time, they're prophesying too. And Joshua, who was Moses' sidekick, it's like Joshua is like Robin to Batman, right? Joshua, I mean, he just starts having a fit. He just says, God, what? Moses, Moses, you know what? And, and Joshua's struggling with this because Moses was his guy. I mean, Moses, you know, and, and I don't think Joshua was thrilled in the first place about 70 other guys having the same spirit on them. And Moses was his guy. And he said, Moses, you got to shut those guys down in the camp. They didn't do it right. They weren't in the right place. This isn't right, you know. And, and then Moses looks at him in verse 29 and says, Joshua, are you jealous? Are you jealous for my sake? Are you of this Old Testament mentality? I mean, Moses is a Old Testament ahead of his time. Are, are, are you just there, like just jealous for my sake, that I'm the only one who can have the Spirit of God on me? I'm the only one who can be God's mouthpiece in, in this world. And then Moses makes, the, I can just hear him just sighing in frustration over Joshua and his limited view of how the Holy Spirit wants to work. And he said, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would have put his spirit on all of them. I can just see him just stretching out his hand across the camp of Israel and saying, Joshua, I just wish God forget 68 and two more over in the camp. I wish God put his spirit on every one of those people in the camp and that every person would become God's mouthpiece and prophesy. And that's the prayer that I believe Moses, God answered. That prophetic prayer of Moses 
that prophetic sigh, oh, that God would put his spirit on all the people. I believe that's the prayer that God answered on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost. Jesus had risen from the dead. He was crucified at Passover. In the Jewish calendar, 50 days later, seven weeks later, was, and a day was the Feast of Pentecost. And Jesus had risen from the dead, and for the first 40 days, he kept appearing to his disciples. And, and one of the things he said towards the end, before he ascended into heaven, uh, until he comes again someday to our world, he said, he said, I don't, I, he said, I don't want you to leave Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power from on high. He kind of used clothing language. On the night of his resurrection, he appeared to them in the room on Resurrection Sunday evening. He appeared to the, the first time he appeared to the group, it said he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Breath is always a picture of life. In fact, spirit and wind are, are, are the word we translate spirit. In the Hebrew and the Greeks, the word for spirit means breath or wind. He breathed on them the night of resurrection night and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I, th I think that's sort of like when we meet Jesus for the first time. And his spirit comes into our life. He washes our sins away. When we put our confidence and what he did and trust in what he did on the cross, he comes in and Jesus said, if you know me, it's going to be like being born all over inside again. And so that's like the new birth. This, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. But now, on the day of Pentecost, came another step. This is not about new life. This is about new power. This is about new power. And the breath of Jesus on the night of resurrection night day becomes now the wind of the Holy Spirit. He said, I want you to stay in Jerusalem. You're going to preach about what I did for people. That they can trust in me and their sins can be forgiven. But don't you dare try to do this alone. It's like, don't try this at home. It's like, you wait in Jerusalem. And so now, by the time the day of Pentecost arrived, they'd been waiting 10 days. Jesus already ascended to heaven. And they'd been waiting 10 days. I don't know if they knew even what was going to happen. But all of a sudden, in Acts 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, the sound of a blowing, the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. So the breath of Jesus on resurrection night had become the wind of the Holy Spirit of Jesus on Pentecost Sunday. Not to give them new life only, but to now give them power. And the next verse says, And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Notice this inclusive language, on all of them, on each of them. And what was happening? Verse 4 explains it. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. That a human being can actually be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now this was, this was all of them. This was not just the 12 apostles who were there. This was not just the Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was also there in the day of Pentecost. It was... It was her that the Spirit overshadowed 33 years earlier when she conceived the Son of God. Now, 33 years later, she's there. She kind of holds a special place, right? But it wasn't just Mary and the 12 apostles. It was all the people that God's Spirit came upon. They could see these flames of fire on their heads. They could all hear the rush of, of this mighty wind from God's house, right, from God's heaven, right into their house, this mighty wind of the Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? And it says, and they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I don't want that to freak you out. Some people say, oh, I like all of this except that speaking in tongues stuff. Why would they speak in tongues? Well, first of all, speaking in tongues, you don't find in the Old Testament. You don't find human beings speaking in other tongues. The closest you get is Balaam's donkey, who spoke Hebrew, <laughs> to rebuke a wayward prophet. But I was a donkey. That doesn't count. I mean, you see all other kinds of works of the Holy Spirit occasionally in the Old Testament. You see healing, working of miracles. You see word of wisdom, word of knowledge. You see discernment in the sense of discerning dreams. You see all these God-given works of the Holy Spirit, but you never see anybody speaking in tongues. Because at the birth of the new church, God reserved this manifestation of speaking in tongues 
for the day he'd pour out his spirit on the new church and recruit every one of us to become his mouthpiece so that we could all be his prophets. This is what Moses had sighed 1,300 years and prayed. Oh, that God would pour his spirit on all the people and they would all prophesy. And so there's this verbal manifestation of speaking in a, in a language you don't understand, but speaking in, in other tongues to remind us why we're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not for us. It's for all those people who line the pathway of your future. That God loves so much, <laughs> he'll even use you if he has to, to reach them. Because he loves them so much. And, and so the speaking of tongues is, is I mean, I pray in tongues every day. It helps build me up spiritually. I mean, we could do a whole message just on that. But, but in this moment, all of a sudden, we are reminded that God on the day of Pentecost answered Moses' prayer. I wish that all God's people could prophesy, that all God's people would become God's mouthpiece into the world so you could speak. I remember I was baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 14 years old. This became very real to me when I was 15 years old. I was sitting in a history class at a large big city high school in Toronto, Canada. And uh, we, we in this history class had just gotten to like ancient history, we we're studying ancient history and we just gotten to the era of the, Ro you know, you have the Greek Empire first and then the Roman Empire. And of course Jesus lived and he was crucified by the Romans and, and then you have the birth of Christianity out of that. And so we're studying that stuff and this, this professor was not a Christian and, 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 and he had an agenda to, to tear anybody who had faith in that classroom to tear their faith away. And um, not a Christian high school, it's a secular public high school. And so he had this, now I'm sitting there, now I, I just kept, remember I said I'm short, shy, you know. Also had a lot of trouble with acne when I was a teenager. And so I'm sitting there and, and I always just was quiet. I rarely spoke up in class. I just stayed low maintenance. Don't bring attention to yourself and just kind of do this. So I'm sitting there with zits on my face <laughs> and painfully self-conscious. And my professor's going on, my history teacher's going on, and something just starts rising up inside of me. And, and I knew that he was wrong. I knew that he was misinterpreting history. He was stating historical facts incorrectly. He was misleading us. And nobody, it turns out there are a couple, three other Christians in the class. They let me know that later, but, <laughs> but nobody was speaking up. But if God's ever given you the Holy Spirit for a reason, it's not just so you can feel more blessed. It's so you can be God's mouthpiece. I raised my hand with my zits. <laughs> and I said, sir, I believe you're not correct there. No, th this is what really happened. And he and I took over the rest of the class until dismissal. At dismissal, he said, I think we'll take this up tomorrow again. So I didn't sleep well that night. <laughs> and so the next day, we just took the entire class. And zits and all, I had the privilege of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with every student in that class. Tell them how Jesus came, died for our sins, and rose again. We can put our faith in him. It was just a very unusual experience. One I wasn't used to, being just a shy kid, keeping to myself alive. That's what the power of the year before God had baptized me in the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, God's Spirit will give you guts. God's Spirit will give you boldness where you're a coward. And God's Spirit will give authority to your words. Ever had a conversation with somebody? And I mean, even that night I was going home and saying, oh, I wish I'd said some things differently. You know, I mean, you just kind of stumble over your words. But when God's Spirit's upon your life, I mean, He can take words and give them authority, even though they're not all perfect. Even sometimes the worst sermons I've preached, people have been most blessed. You know, I mean, I just can't figure this out. I was once preaching and, and this lady came out to me and she was so emphatic that that message changed her life that, that I, I, I just decided to ask her, well, what, what specifically about the message changed her life? She went on to describe something I never even remotely referred to in the entire sermon. But you know, the rocket science, God once said, you preach it and I'll land it. You let it fly and I'll land it. This, see, God knows how to land it. God knows how to take your simple words and your good intentions 
Even when you stumble, God has a way of putting spiritual authority on your words. He can give you boldness. He can open up doors. The pressure is not on you. You get up in the morning. So get, Lord, give me opportunity to be an influence for you today. Give me an opportunity to be your mouthpiece. And then watch, watch the, what the creative God can do in you and through you. His spirit, his spirit, he, 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 he filled them all, all, no exceptions. He filled them all in that upper room waiting to be clothed with power and, and, and to be sent out in the world to preach the gospel, which is still going on like never before in our world 2,000 years later because that wind of the Spirit's still blowing through our world. That wind of the Spirit's still blowing through churches like yours, still blowing through families like yours, through you. God's Spirit making you His mouthpiece, making you His person wherever you go. This is God's Spirit, the Spirit in you that goes through you. So now they're watching this. The crowd is watching this on the day of Pentecost as these believers, followers of Christ are being filled with the Spirit. And they're going, like, these people are drunk. And so Peter gets up and says in verse 15, these Peter people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. You know, and, and, and again, we go back to the Old Testament. And he says, in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Even your young people will prophesy. And your, old, and your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. There's no racial discrimination here. There's no age discrimination here. There's no gender discrimination here. In fact, he goes on in verse 18, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And I believe God's altar call to us is get over yourself and be filled with the Holy Spirit and leave it all in God's hands. You know, I was 15 years old, my junior year in high school, I spoke up, did all that thing, disrupted history class and all that. It's interesting that this never happened to me another time, but at the end of my, that semester, God, um, I, I, uh, the Lord did something. Uh, to really teach me in a, in a very affirming way. Um, at the end of every semester, uh, our high school would blend all your individual grades in individual classes, average them together, and you get a final grade, one grade for the semester, sort of like a grade point average, a little different than that, but one grade. And then they'd post in the hallway from the top grade in the school all the way down this long, long list of students. It was a very large high school. So I remember at the end of that particular semester, I went, and usually I was within the top 25 percentile. So I looked about a quarter of the way down the list to find my name, and I couldn't find it. It was clear it wasn't down lower, so I started going up. Started going up the list, up the list, up the list, up the list. Until my name was number one. I got the highest grade in the entire high school that semester. And... I will never forget the Spirit of God speaking to me in that moment, 15 years old. He said, if you will let me use you, I'll take care of your reputation. I'll take care of every other thing in your life. If you will stay available to me, watch what I can do. And that's what he's saying to you. If you just surrender, just stay available to him. Just be hungry for him to fill you. I don't care whether you think you got it or not of other talents or other opportunities or other platforms. I don't know if you're popular or not, but I want to tell you, even your reputation Jesus can take. Because you've got to die to your reputation if you're going to be God's mouthpiece. It's going to make some people hate you. Not everybody's going to be on your team. People are going to reject you. But that's why you're here, to be full of the Holy Spirit. Because God loves people so much that he, that he said... Not some of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, but all of them were filled with the Spirit. So I'd like you to bow your heads with me. And we're just going to pray as the worship team comes. First of all, I'd like to just pray with you. There may be some of you here today that uh, don't really walk with Jesus. Y your heart's not right with God. Y y you're sinning. You're doing things on your own. You're going your own way. Um, but, but you just need to know Jesus. This is why God gave the church the Holy Spirit, so that we could, in the power of the Holy Spirit, let you know that you can be saved. You can be saved from your sin, you can be delivered from demonic strongholds, and 
and Jesus can breathe his life into you and you can belong to him. And it does mean saying no to sin, but it means saying yes to Jesus' forgiveness when he shed his blood on the cross for you. He can wash away your sin with his shed blood and he rose again and his resurrection spirit can give you new life right now. And so I'm just going to pray. And if that's you, I just want you in your heart to pray along with me. Our Father, we thank you that you made us, that we're not a mistake. Forgive me, Lord Jesus, for walking away from you. Forgive me for going my own way. But I just need a relationship with you. I just want you to come into my life and to make me new. I just need your spirit. I ask you to forgive me and come into my life. Start a relationship with me, I pray. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I just invite you in to come and live in my heart, live in my life. And I'll follow you, Lord Jesus. I'll follow you.